For nearly six years, Zach Reno and Jess McKenna brought us an original musical every single week in real time with Off Book, the improvised musical podcast. Off Book, the improvised musical podcast with Zach and Jess. Accompanied by Scott Passarella, King of Pianists, Pianist of Kings, Brett on the frets, Morris, that feeling when the chord hits, Dana Wicks on the sticks, Wickens, producing the drums as good as they come, and occasional guest musicians rotating in, as well as Karate Bird and Male Person Stacy, Zach, Jess, and their guests brought us so many joyful musicals full of singing animals, unpaid product placement, insecure but communicative characters supporting each other, and an ongoing quest to find out what sound the wooden frog makes. And every single episode is incredible. Some end up being surprisingly tight musicals, others are just delightful chaos, but every episode is infinitely better than any musical I could write, and they've been improvising these every week. And now, unfortunately, the weekly podcast has come to an end. Although Zach and Jess show absolutely no signs of slowing down, they're going to bring us fantastic stuff for a very long time, and I can't wait for all of it. But as we say goodbye to new weekly musicals from Zach and Jess, it's time to look back and revisit my favorite improvised songs from these improvised musicals. Welcome to the D-List, the show where I list things and my name begins with a D. And today I'm counting down my very favorite songs from Off Book, the improvised musical podcast. Now let me make one thing clear. Every single Off Book song is a banger. There's basically no wrong answer when someone asks you your favorite Off Book song. So to make it easier to narrow this down, I'm only including songs that feature into the narrative of the improvised musicals. I'm not including ads, songs from undercovers or fan band episodes, Every Place I Cry songs, and I'm especially not including songs from the bonus segment at the end, because if I was, every single slot would go to this. There's a new cop on the street! And even with those stipulations, this was incredibly hard to narrow down, which is why this list is so damn long. So sit back and relax as I share my overwritten thoughts about my favorite songs that were made up on the spot. Number 30. Skrillex is nervous as he prepares for his New Year's rave, and his definitely loyal butler Aloysius, who couldn't possibly have any ulterior motives, gives him some reassuring advice. It will be so fine when the beat just drops, so all you gotta do is hold the line. Wait for it, 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 wait for it. It's a lesson in patience and in raising the audience's anticipation and trusting them to join you for a ride. Just a little Skrillex guy with no hair on the side And sometimes I feel like I have lost my pride Wait for it, wait for it, wait for it, wait for it But mostly it's just a fun exercise for Zach and Jess to do a vocal drop. Now. <laughs> Look, I'm too old and tired to go to New Year's Eve parties, but if a host promised they'd sync this song up so the final drop hit at midnight, I'd make the effort. Even if we would all die. Spoilers for later in the episode. Number 29. Andy Daly is Mandy, who is so overjoyed by everything his town offers that he can't choose what activities he should do and where he should work. But he is particularly tempted by Guinevere and Lancelot at an erotic archery camp. Because when you lick an arrow and you shoot it at a target, what goes into a target? Mm, A hard dick because an arrow. To their credit, they work hard to be an inclusive and supportive erotic archery camp. An arrow is a dick and the target is a vagina. Oh really, just your partner's needs on their body. No matter what type of body you find them. Longtime subscribers to my channel may recall that as soon as I heard this episode, I had no choice but to mash this song up with another favorite subject of Zach and Jess's. My job is to satisfy my target. Yeah. <laughs> Make the target happy however I can. However you can. And 
shockingly, that has yet to be blocked for violating any sort of content guidelines. If you take one thing away from this, archery is sex! Yeah, is archery is sex! sex. Offbook is often cited as having a more wholesome energy than a lot of comedy podcasts, but when they go blue, they make it count. Number 28. Vicky Vox joins Zack and Jess for a musical about huskies on a sled team who dream of a wider world. They find a brochure with a big shiny ball that they just want to get their claws on, and they start imagining what kind of a world might have such a big ball. What is an Epcot Center? Um, I don't know. I'm looking at this and I'm thinking Epcot, Epcot Center. Center. Is that how you say this word? Epcot. Ep Is that that one? Ep and it turns out huskies are really perceptive. I'm imagining a place with tiny nations. I'm imagining a place that values imagination. Yes, big shocker. The guy who makes theme park jokes on YouTube likes the songs with theme park jokes on a podcast. Yeah, this won't be the only one on this list. I don't know, it's just a sentiment, but I think that there's a guy there called Figment. I'm imagining. I don't mean to be bragging, but I think that the guy is a little purple dragon. Boy, I hope for their sake they're imagining him in 1998 or earlier. And when I think about it and the meaning I am nearing, I'm not imagining, I am imagineering. I think Huskies will enjoy Epcot if they ever make it there, even if it's the park they'd fit into third best, maybe? They could easily build a habitat for them in Animal Kingdom, or they could replace the Country Bear Jamboree with a Husky Hullabaloo. But, you know, Epcot, they could find something to do there. They got enough space to run around. It's a little word. Oh, I get it. And it's That's sort of what comes to me when I look at that big shiny ball. When you're a husky and you're just intuiting things, you know? Number 27. What started as a chills giving gets chaotic as an orphan arrives. Turns out it's actually a turkey in disguise as an orphan, who later disguises herself as the Travelocity Gnome. And I'll take uh, this little bit of uh, this string from your shirt and I'll just... Oh, cool. And um, uh, oh. if you um, put me in your... Uh, garden i'm uh <laughs> right at gnome <laughs> wow, i look cool. like like a garden gnome now huh yeah wow like the like the travelocity guy yeah exactly the turkey meets up with another turkey in disguise as green beans played by guest colton dunn i may or may not be a turkey <gasps> hiding as a green bean oh, look this look at all these green beans in the shape of a turkey gobble gobble be careful it might be my best friend they're on the run, not only from Thanksgiving itself, but also from a police officer, and they gradually explain to young Ethan who the officer really is. I'll tell you the truth if you're ready. Yeah, I'm ready. If you're ready to hear it. Uh, yes, I am ready. It turns out the police officer is actually Turkey's natural rival in disguise. He's three chicken steps. He's a chicken. As soon as the premise for this song was revealed, there was a specific pop culture reference I was hoping to hear, and almost as soon as I had the thought, Zach delivered. He wears a disguise to look like human guys, but he's not a man, he's a chicken dude. One, two, three. And Ethan is reminded of his destiny as a precocious child in a holiday special. Tiny precocious children save holidays every year. You're right. Like that girl in the Grinch, or that girl in the Grinch, or, or that girl in the Grinch. That's right. So he enacts his plan based on his particular set of skills. And then you will be free. You, but when I yell out Freebird at a concert, this is the song I'm asking for. And we will finally be two Freebirds! Number 28. 
Number 26. Matthew's uncle at Scholastic gave him an advanced copy of the new Goosebumps book, which only happens when you read it. And it starts happening to Matthew, Devin, and Claire, played by Rashawn Scott, as they encounter supernatural creatures and have to break their various curses. And when they dispose of some spikes that were threatening to a scary balloon, the balloon has a change of attitude. Hmm, this is so strange. He's on the ground. I was floating in the air late one night. <laughs> And I'm giving these students a terrible fright. A terrible fright! You're scaring me! But and now he only has one thing on his mind. Well, I was up in the air <laughs> late one night. Not getting to smash give me quite a fright. But now I'll get to do it with my spouse, who, as you know, is a bounce house. For being improvised on the spot, this is a surprisingly tight parody song. They don't do it for cash, but they accept it. Put out on OnlyFans our inflatable smash. And if you watch a smash, you can pay us in cash. The kids aren't sure if they should be there for it, but it seems less inappropriate to witness than it could be. There's not really penetration. They just kind of bounce around. A balloon and a bounce house really going to town. I kind of like that they're just smashing up against each other. They're like smooth Ken dolls, just giving it to each other. I think I like it. This episode of Off Book came out two days after the D-list episode where I counted down my favorite Monster Mash parodies. Otherwise, this would have absolutely made the list. Why should that have only had one sex-based parody that you can hear on a podcast? Podcast. I've been missing you. Thank you for clearing the curse, children. I've been away from my wife for too long. Okay, that one started out as my least favorite, but ended as my favorite. Yeah, me too. <laughs> Number 25. The very first episode of Off Book ever released features podcast mainstay, funniest man alive, and the man who should be the next host of The Late Late Show, if I have anything to say about it, Paul F. Tompkins. It's a great introduction to the podcast, full of certified bangers, including a fast, furious road trip. Tokyo Drifting! Tokyo Drifting! Three dudes, three cars, road trip, Tokyo Drifting! A tribute to famous rabbits who aren't Oswald. There's other rabbits. Oswald's not the only one. And, of course... Dang, 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 da dang, dang, da dang, dang, da dang, 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 you know. But for my money, the best song in this episode is the one that started them all. You gotta crush a kid's dreams to watch them fly. After a school play, the parents are upset at their talentless children, and they do not hold back. I don't want you to act anymore. In fact, go home right now. You drove me. No, I'm gonna have to find your own way back. As soon as I listened to this the day it dropped, I knew I was in for something special when these opening notes started and Zach brought out this absurdly bad philosophy of parenting. I was immediately hooked on off book. And it hurt my ears. What? Made my ears feel bad. <laughs> Watching you try and fail so totally bad. It made me really sad. So These are terrible, terrible parents, but my God, is it funny listening to their disproportionate rage. Okay, well just drive me home, all right? Nope, find your own way home. Wait, what? <laughs> And then it all ramps up to Paul's verse, as he had minutes earlier expressed anxiety about musical improv. I'm usually one of those guys where I get one rhyme out, and then I'm so relieved that I made a rhyme that I lose it for the rest of the song. So naturally, he freaking crushes it. I am just sick. Sick to my guts. Not to your guts. You've got to quit this nonsense, and there's no ifs, ands, or buts. Whoa! He brings the rhymes, he brings the singing, and he brings the really terrible parenting. I can't stand what I just saw, and that other people saw it too. <sighs> you shouldn't be on stage, you should be in a goddamn zoo. Okay, oh, well. Wow, Dad. Dad. You really hurt our pride. Yeah. But will you please at least give us, us a ride? Parents close with exactly the priorities you'd expect parents with no perspective to have. And most importantly, no matter who we are going home, we're gonna have so much room in the car. And there it was.
was. I was addicted. Sleepy baby for life. Number 24. At the mock trial dinner, Alicia discovers that she's more accomplished than she realized. And Spencer is surprised that she had no idea she was a genius. Everything you do in your kind of day-to-day -day life is like genius level intelligence. And I don't think you just, you just don't know that. But it turns out that her frame of reference for such a thing was limited. Genius, that's like, that's like people who like clean up MIT and then they solve a big hard math problem. That guy is a genius. Spencer tries explaining this to her, but to no avail. I guess that's one kind of genius, one specific kind of genius. There are other kinds of genius too. Look, even geniuses have their blind spots. I've never even had a crush with someone who I thought was smarter, but then I proved myself and drove across the country for her. One of the delights of musical improv is when a performer perfectly sets himself up for a rhyme, and one of the delights of specifically watching Zach and Jess do musical improv is how well tuned they are to each other's sensibilities and seeing them pick up on where each other is going with it. So when Jess sings this... Am I smart? I suppose, yes, that's true. It does not take Zach long to realize she's setting up this. But never have I gotten in a bar fight in Cambridge and said, How do you like them apples? Seriously, look at this recording from the audience. Look at the delight on his face once he realizes where she's going with it. It's, it's just so joyful. I promise that's the kind of genius I am not fronting. I only know of geniuses from good. Number 23. The one-year anniversary episode of Off Book is full of so many returning guests from previous episodes. Many of those guests reprise some of their characters they played in their earlier episodes, but one who doesn't is Paul Shear, who just plays a custodial engineer. But this custodial engineer happens to be a big Off Book fan, and he tells the story of how the podcast helped him through a dark time. Little boy, so young and cute. And nobody expected exactly how dark that time would get. And everyone thought he was grand. And then one day he killed everyone in the land. What? With the bomb. What? Wait, oh my and Jess brings the chorus, a sweet tribute to how art helps us move through hard times, only occasionally thrown by the jarring bleakness of the engineer's story. Are you saying we killed your heart with a song? Yeah, your yeah. heart with a song. PFT comes in as the space engineer, playing straight man by trying to clarify the details of the story. Just to be clear, your son committed a genocide. Man, you listened to this podcast and you felt better, yeah. right? Yeah. Okay, I got it straight. That seems a little wrong. Then Zeke Nicholson's love engineer vampire tells his story, which is significantly less drastic than Shears. You know I was alone all of my life. Of I my know life. that I went to an off-book event where what do you know I met my wife. The juxtaposition of the sweet and the dark is one of my favorite tones for comedy music to take, and this is such a fine example of that. Your podcast healed my heart. perfectly parodies the kind of self-congratulatory love fest that an anniversary episode could have been, while still effectively celebrating the genius that makes this show so magical. Number 22. Ryan, played by Robin Lord Taylor, and Dermot are on a magical journey through the mystical realm of Cincinnati, led by a magical unicorn and an incredibly mansplainy phoenix. You know, Maybe. I gave Tolkien a vision because, like, we do this sometimes. This was you! Well, you know, sometimes, like, magical creatures. I helped! I helped! You weren't. <laughs> the unicorn reveals that she gave Tolkien a vision that helped inspire Lord of the Rings, and the obnoxious phoenix reveals that he came up with the obnoxious parts. They grow them 
and shape them and make them their own Telling stories that help us all feel less alone And I do Tom Bombadil I came up with Tom Bombadil Look, you've seen my Tolkien Adaptation Month videos. You all know that I actually do love the Tom Bombadil chapters. Bombadil is legitimately one of my favorite characters. But I also love basically every joke that makes fun of Tom Bombadil. So using Bombadil as the avatar for every genius's worst and most obnoxious ideas is just hilarious. You know, I may have given Tolkien the idea of a, a fellowship and different species and races of men who have to come together to fight a universal evil. And Phoenix came up with Tom Bombadil. Tom Bombadil of Forest Lore. I don't even know who that is. Exactly. <laughs> then the second verse is about Harry Potter, which I think the unicorn became less proud of inspiring in the years that followed. But the final verse is just top notch. And Unicorn came to Steve Jobs and gave him a vision for a company. Oh my god. I also gave him Tom Bombadil. Which he intuited to be the thing where every couple models you have to change the charging jack. That's so On your way. phone, that's a Tom Bombadil. This is not even the only song this podcast has done about Tom Bombadil. Zach and Jess know how to pander to me directly. Number 21. This might be borderline, but I'm counting this episode as a narrative. Two of my favorite podcasts crossover as the good boys of Podcast The Ride wrap up their Country Bear Jamber Week by taking Zach and Jess to see a Country Bear Jamboree. Not the Country Bear Jamboree, but one of them. Take your eyes on the stage while Chrysanthemum's presents part of the Sugar Plum Ballet from the Nutcracker. Chrysanthemum Sue begins her dance, and the humans are surprised when they are invited to dance along. An arabesque in second position, and you can do it too. They want us to do it too? I think they want us to do it too. I, that they can't already be right. sang along. I don't know if I get ballet it's along. ballet. That can't yeah. be right. That I don't know if he's moo. I have not a dance Everybody knowledge. Everybody get up and do the Whoa, dance! Okay. Before the show, everyone is reassured that the bears are safe, but that may have been a premature assessment. Where is your turnout? We don't want to eat you. Please try to move from your hips. Yeah, these bears did not forget that they are bears. Pot of array and pirouette and spin. And spin. Okay, spin. Security bears will eat you alive if you do not come in. Rough up the one in six three. <laughs> Bring him up here. Bring him up here. Bring one of them up here on stage. <laughs> and Scott is roped up on stage to be part of the dance, and he faces a fade almost as scary as Chucko. I could simply crush your body and tear off all of your limbs. Oh, no, please don't. The but I won't if you try. Just give it your all. Part of a It's such a good juxtaposition of adorable daintiness and gruesome carnage. I can think of no better way to parody the Country Bear Jamboree. Bear ballet's kind of fun. I'm glad that I've tried, but please let me go. Juniper, is that a gun? It's okay. <laughs> now, this is its for my protection, but I'm just showing you it so you know I have it. Number 20. At Sunnybrook High, the new batch of teachers actually get through to the kids, and suddenly the kids are second-guessing their tradition of sacrificing teachers to the unspeakable hell beast beneath the school. We gotta find a way to get rid of this monster so we don't have to feed it teachers. What if we just ask them for help? Yeah, let's go to their houses right now. I'm sure they're still up, watching cool shows, or doing cool adult stuff. Come on! Everyone on your bikes! So the kids are on a mission, and that mission is accompanied by synths and the appropriate driving beat. It's midnight, and we're biking to our teachers' houses. Yeah, it's midnight, and we're biking to our teachers' houses. And they got to accumulate all the teachers they want to save and ask them for advice. Miss Sutton, you did such a good job today. You taught Eugene about Shakespeare and his dunks. So we all got side by side on our bikes and we biked to this groovy fun. 
This song just captures the excitement of kids on a mission after curfew so well. As the musical becomes a pastiche of Stranger Things, this song fully encapsulates the tone of everything that Stranger Things is a pastiche of. Everyone in the world has got a thing that they like. And kids like nothing in the world more than riding in a gang on their bikes. Guest Brigahelin is such a good fit with Zack and Jess, both as the teacher she plays and the student she plays. As one might expect, this mission takes about an hour. What time is it? It's, um, it's 1 a.m. now. Okay. Okay, yeah, pretty much. Sure. Yeah. It's 1 a.m. House. Full disclosure, first time I listened to this episode, I was half awake, fading in and out of sleep, but for whatever reason in my loopy state, I was particularly receptive to this song. I could feel the excitement pounding, and I'm sure it made whatever dreams I was having kick ass. I don't really remember, though, because it was five years ago, but, uh, boy, I should just fall asleep to this song more often. <laughs> Number 19. There's been a murder on the picturesque express, so nobody's coming to see poor little Jane Lee in the dining car until a captain of art industry comes in, followed by a blind, rich, freckled little boy. Through the course of the discussion, the children realize who the man is. Are you... Paints McSpectrum? And he belts out a confirmation. I am Paints McSpectrum. Paints McSpectrum. And I decided to paint Everyone on this train. Everyone on this train. Man, listen to Hot Saucerman's Pipes. That encouragement from Josh Groban really must have paid off. Seriously, you have a really, really, really good singing voice. Better than yours? Yes. I'm just a rich little boy, but I'm gonna throw my hand in. I love this man's work. Did you know we have several originals of his hanging in my mansion? I guess the blind, rich, freckled little boy enjoys the feel or the smell of his paintings. Because I'm Paints McSpectrum, you know I'm Paints McSpectrum, because I'm Paints McSpectrum. In the grand tradition of musical numbers that just consist of characters introducing themselves, I'd probably rank this one even higher than most that were actually written ahead of time. Bravo, bravo. So, thank, oh, uh, thank you. I've never been applauded for just telling people information before. <laughs> and a friendship that will surely last forever is formed. And, and we're the best of friends. Who right? we are. Oh. Best friends. I, I threw it out there and I thought... And that, I liked it. Okay, good. I also enjoyed it. <laughs> this character made such an impact that he had to return not only in the first anniversary show, but in the second to last weekly episode with a mysterious reprise of his theme that may have gone even harder. Number 18. Brayden, played by Laser the Boy of the Double Clicks fame, wants to play mind games on game night, but Carla is concerned it'll turn into the most dangerous game. But the reference is lost on both Brayden and Darren. The most dangerous game is man. Oh, so we all wear ties and suits, and we cook a steak on the grill. And when someone says it's okay to cry, we say no, it is not. Not okay to cry. Carla tries to explain, and the boys keep on misunderstanding. Huh. No, it's just <laughs> the one where someone hunts a man. Oh, so it is paintball. No. So it is laser tag. No. It's a classic comedic game of miscommunication executed perfectly as Laser and Zack keep finding new ways to miss the point. The meat is from the most dangerous thing, which of course is a magical Man. horse. No. A magical no. horse. A magical horse that can kick you right into the snow. No. It has a big horn and it will impale your stomach. No, that's a unicorn. Brett and guest pianist Zach Marsh give the song just the right amount of spooky but goofy flair. The man hunts another man. 
And when he catches the man, they play the most dangerous game, which is Yahtzee on the island. And the reveal that the boys were just playing mind games themselves this whole time is just so perfect. Like, I don't think you could write a better execution of this premise than these fine folks improvised. Play a game with, with your mind. We all read it. We were all in ninth grade together. I can't believe you did that to me. Yeah, so pause real quick. Yeah, I was yeah. having real fun playing mind games. Yeah, right yeah, now. yeah, yeah, yeah. You said it was not like gaslighting. It felt like gaslighting. I guess my question was, did I win and how do I know if I won? Number 17. It's another crossover between two of my favorite podcasts as the Doctors of Super Ego join the off book team. Matt Gorley, Jeremy Carter, Mark McConville, and PFT join Zach and Jess for a musical about Oscars night. The vote counters are working hard, but they get distracted when they keep finding things in the closet. Yeah. Guys, I was in this broom closet and I just found 36 votes for La La Land. Should I do anything with these? Ooh, don't tell, don't anyone. tell anyone you found those. Every closet seems to contain some mysterious or controversial piece of Oscar history, whether human or anthropomorphized. I want to look in a closet to find more Oscar mysteries. Hey, hey, hey! I should have won, not Shakespeare in love. Some of them are snubs from the awards themselves. Some of them are controversies with the broadcast. Hey, it's me, 3-6 Mafia. Just <laughs> polishing my Oscar. This is a perfect setup for the Super Ego guys, who tend to excel at improvised sketches where everybody goes around in a circle and pops in as a kooky character. Hey, it's me, Snow White. Why did everybody get so mad? I was just trying to be sexy and dance a little bit with Rob Lowe. And they also excel at quickly pulling pieces of pop culture history with varying levels of obscurity. And it's a me, Roberto Bonini. <laughs> so good at running on chairs. And Zach may not have as much Oscar history knowledge as the other participants. This show frequently tells me about how many things I don't know. <laughs> that was a moment like that. It's all good. Me. But he still manages to come in with a perfect joke. And it's me, Oscar the Grouch. I may have misunderstood what this closet was for. Number 16. Poetry 1959, live at Dynasty Typewriter with Taron Killam, is an incredible episode with so many standout songs, but for me, there's one that stands out above the rest. When the British poet hooligans gather to prep for the arrival of the new American poet, they brace for the difference in poetry philosophies. Poetry, as we all know, is a means by which we very clearly and very literally express the world around us and the things we see That's and right. the feelings that we feel. So that when somebody reads it, they go, oh, I understand this. Good job. <laughs> may, I, may I read you my poem that I wrote this morning? Please do. Let's hear it. Let's hear it. Breakfast time. I am hungry for beans, kippers and mash. Every street poet brings their extremely literal, not particularly poetic, but still quite relatable piece to the table. I need new boots because my old boots are bad. And my old boots, they were just hand-me-downs from me dad. And it all ties back to the most relatable feeling of all, hunger. So I guess I'll have to go down to the bank and make a withdrawal Cause I need me some cash What you gonna buy? Maybe Kippers some and mash Kippers and mash Kippers and mash This is the first episode to feature Brad on the frets and both he and guest drummer Eric Calver really enhanced the tone of the tune Oh look, it's 2.30 in the afternoon Oh my gosh That's it's not like a normal eating time We're in between time. meals We're in between That's not lunch All right, or dinner Alright, let's just go get it? a light snack Oh yeah. Hmm. Oh, let me see what I've got in my pantry. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Well, are either of you interested in some... Beans, kippers and mash, kippers and mash. I know this is playing into the stereotype of British food being bland, but they're kind of making it sound delicious. Beans, kippers and mash. Mash, 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 mash. Number 15. Las Culturistas themselves, Bowen Yang and Matt Rogers, join for a musical about Broadway itself, specifically a story where every Broadway producer decides to add Let It Go to their own musicals without getting clearance from Disney. And before opening night on one of these musicals, romance is in the air. Is it just a trope? That thing they 
say about Broadway causing people to fall in love. But the players are nervous about whether their feelings are real or whether they're just playing into narrative expectation. Two young actresses who found each other. One actress named Garrett. One actress named Marissa. It is impressive when the show has guests who carry a whole verse on their own without any assist from Zach and Jess, and Bowen and Matt are utterly fantastic here. Thing is real. I hope the way that I feel is the way you feel. It's not a trope. It's not a trope. It's so real. I hope the way I feel is the way that you feel. Meanwhile, the techs are also struggling with similar feelings. Is it a trope? When two checks fall in love because of Hell Week, is it a trope? Is it just a rumor Hollywood's trying to sell me? But someone who's actively defying the tropes is the director. Everyone thinks I'm an asshole, but I am not. I buy everyone lunch. It's a beautiful song that honestly doesn't have that many jokes in it, and it wouldn't be out of place in a legitimate, pre scripted, non parody musical. So I say we add this song to every musical instead of Let It Go. Tonight. Oh, we can only hope that the lives we lead aren't just a trope. Two minutes. Oh, okay. Thank you, Jill. Um. Number 14, Hollywood, 1939. Amid the glitz and the glitter of a bustling young movie town at the height of its golden age, the Hollywood Tower Hotel was a star in its own right and the subject of a live episode of Off Book with Rachel Bloom. That's right, episode 79 is a live Tower of Terror musical, and all the characters in the pre-show are there, except Rod Serling, but all the fictional ones. Jess plays the child star and Mark Label, legally distinct from Clark Gable, Rachel plays the child star's guardian and Matherin Mepburn, and Zach plays the bellhop, and Richard Mouse. And yes, it's a much better Tower of Terror story than the Gutenberg film, but it's also one that probably wouldn't get approved by Disney, due in particular to this number. Tell us what's something you've never, ever, have you ever, ever done? I've Matt never, Matt Burn. I've never not had the clap, am I right? <laughs> those were all three of us, I assume. I'm we're so a, sick. A, we're, the three of us were a round of applause. <laughs> Turns out Mark, Matherin, and Richard get around town a lot. I was on set of kids and of balls and I Mark may be legally distinct from Clark, but that doesn't mean the two can't hook up. I turn around and I fell to my knees Because you know, you know I know I had to give Clark Gable a real quick blow Look, it's a more accurate depiction of the private lives in Hollywood's golden age than the ride shows us. You know, besides the animated talking mouse. And I was on a steamboat I know I have a lot of regular Disney Park visitors in my audience, and I just want to make sure you all have this mental image too next time you're on Tower of Terror or Mission Breakout. Stars! Stars! Talking! 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 Dirty! And I've been a child here the whole time! <laughs> Look, you'd be shocked how many other songs Zach and Jess have done with theme park jokes that didn't make this list. Number 13. I said that episode one of Off Book had me immediately addicted, and fortunately, I did not have to wait long for a second fix, because episodes one and two were released on the same day, and episode two, also full of bangers. But there's one in particular that stands out head and shoulders over the others. In preparation for a fierce competition over who gets to be the mall's next ShamWow demonstrator, Dieter slips away to get a pretzel for his son Gunther, 
but he isn't prepared for the upselling. No, I'd like un- well, we got a lot of kinds of pretzels. No, I'd like un wetzel's pretzels. That you might like to try. No, Don't just- be so sure of what kind of pretzel you want. <laughs> no. There's a wide variety of zesty pretzels at Wetzel's Pretzels, some of which are more impressive than others. Some zestos will help you see the future. Some Wetzel's Pretzels have the zest of kombucha. And Mary Holland comes in with a chorus so catchy that it legitimately should have become an official Wetzel's Pretzels jingle by now. Never mind the fact that I have never in my life seen them actually advertise. Wetzel's Pretzels, Wetzel's they're amazing. Wetzel's Pretzels, they're amazing. Listen to the customer. Wetzel's Pretzels, they're amazing. Wetzel's Pretzels, Wetzel's Pretzels. Granted, maybe it couldn't be the corporate jingle because it turns out this Wetzel's goes in its own direction. We got vitamin C, other supplements. We got acai berry. That ain't makes no sense. You can put it on a hot dog. You can put it on a bun. When it comes to Wetzel's pretzels, we're the only one that does this. Wetzel's pretzels, they're amazing. Independently owned. Not only is it the only place to get Wetzel's and Jamba combined into one, but it's the only Wetzel's pretzels where you can get a vodka lemonade. Would you like to add a lemonade? No. A lemonade on the side. Not a normal lemonade. There's a lemonade that's got something to hide. This song immediately gets stuck in my head anytime I see a Wetzel's pretzels. Walking through City Walk in downtown Disney, it's just, it's always this, no matter what is playing in the loudspeakers. Technically not a bar! Wetzel's pretzels, they're amazing! Listen to the customer, Wetzel's pretzels! We are drunk! I'm so drunk on Wetzel's pretzels! Just two pretzels then? Yes, please. Uh, had to try. <laughs> Number 12. In the first of what became a holiday tradition, Paul F. Tompkins and Nicole Parker joined for a holiday adventure in the doggy town of Doggywood. Guest pianist Sam Janitis brings us back from intermission with an upbeat bounce as two brothers begin their Doggywood dreams at the local hotel. It's a very fancy and ritzy hotel. Oh so, man, a hotel for dogs? Oh, it's never, ah, that's right. I never heard of such well, a thing. Well, it's a wonderful thing and I think you'll really enjoy yourself here. At this hotel for dogs. Hotel for dogs. After some verses taking a tour of the hotel amenities, the game shifts to title dropping other dog based media. Out here is a big old field for these dogs, and this field is covered in snow. It's for those snow dogs. Snow dogs. And that is just a delight listening to this group name drop as many as they possibly can. Where do I drop my key at? Where is that found when me and my brother are finally homeward bound? <laughs> I've got a question to we do check out could you point us to the pup who lets the dogs out who lets the dogs out is the kind of goofy energy this show excels at and pft and nicole have already proven themselves to be natural fits for this kind of silliness i know that you'll be asking who is that doggy in the window <laughs> give it five stars no i'll give it seven i'd say this hotel is like i died and went oh. But here's Darla's room. Number 11. Tawny Newsom is Captain Stark of the International Space Station, and this is before she was on Space Force or Star Trek. This is, as far as I know, the original Tawny Newsom space themed comedy. I don't think we're the only ones who got programmed, and I don't think the ship is the only one who got reprogrammed. I th- think you got reprogrammed. <laughs> what? Captain! the best in your field. When Stark threatens to kidnap the entire crew because she has no family left of her own, the crew realizes she's been reprogrammed to think that, and they help her remember her father, Kurt Russell. You and Kurt Russell playing catch. catch. Uh, I hope it goes better for you than it did for his other outer space offspring. Kurt Russell is my dad. Do you know what I mean? Gradually, Stark starts to remember the rest of her family, too. So I guess this means I'm getting a little misty. I guess this means Kate Hudson is my sister. I mean, you have other siblings, too, but you don't have to list them all. I guess I'll always know who I am to me. is 
one of the most talented humans alive, and it's delightful to hear her pour her all into this tune, really getting to the emotional core of such a goofy song about name-dropping celebrities. Number 10. Darcy Carden joins for a big ol' pop culture musical mashup in which the great surgeon Dr. Seuss, rival of Richard Scarry, is operating on the Grinch to make room in his ribcage for his massive heart growth, but the doctor has to come face to face with the fact that the beast he hunted to roast for the feast was actually the Beauty and the Beast Beast. The doctor goes and returns to the Beast Castle to confront his mistake. Hello? I know I was here very many years ago and, and you made a glorious feast for me, but now I'm back because my heart is... Well, it's shrunk eight sizes with remorse. Very, very good. But this time, instead of inviting him to be their guest, the servants have a different request. There's something we need from you for us to have a ball. Open the drawer, pick up Monsieur Knife, and kill us all. Kill, kill. us. Kill, Kill us all, throw our bodies down the hall. Please make sure we all are very dead so we can rest in peace. Kill wow, that got dark. I love it. You can take a knife, you can take a gun. We don't really care, I promise we won't run. You Look, they've really abandoned hope about the spell ever being broken now. They want to be put out of their misery. I get it. Here's a bat, here's a sword. Use them both, don't get bored. Just smash us all up and throw my friends across the floor. Especially since, I don't know about you, but I'm imagining the live-action remake designs for these characters. Those guys really want to be put out of their misery. Number 9. The town of Sad's a lot must stay sad at all times, but this way of life may be at risk due to a spy from the happiest town in the world, Copenhagen. A sneaky, smiley spy. Yes, a sneaky, smiley spy. We must destroy sneaky, this person. Sneaky, smiley spy. We must destroy this person. I will sneaky, not sit spy. by. So the town council, the saddest of the sad, decide how they're going to deal with this. There is nothing more disgusting than a sneaky, smiley spy. You can't get more on the nose in a villain song than villains who are literally trying to put a stop to happiness itself. Itself. It's perfect. There are many disguises and lies of this sneaky, smiley spy. Will Hines' character has a particularly devious plan for dealing with this spy. I would like to take the spy and remove all of his bones. And then I'll say to the spy, you're too flop. Now to do much harm. It's worth mentioning that this isn't one of the songs where Will's headphones weren't working, so Dang Without Headphones Man doesn't apply to this song. But to the ones it does apply to in this episode, Dang Without Headphones Man? Because the best kind of a spy is a floppy flingy guy. Well, that's just counter espionage 101. As a warning to an spy. Also, they can't finish the meeting without bake sale business. Uh, I'm bringing bread. Does anyone mind if I bring a rustic raisin rye? A rustic raisin rye! Also, this episode in general is essential because it's the origin of the name of the off-book fans. Love you, good night. Love you, good night. No, don't go to sleep. No, 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 don't go to sleep. No, no, Zach, do not tuck them in. Zach, don't tuck them in. No, 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 don't tuck them in. Number eight. Jess is Carol, a scientist working on the Large Hadron Collider who realizes she has no idea how to communicate with other people, especially when she realizes her own colleagues are actively hoping to create a black hole. But she starts making a connection with Lisa in the biology lab, played by the delightful Taylor Ortega, who similarly feels alone to the point where her best relationship is with her frog with an imagined voice. So Carol and Lisa make a date to flip the switch together, and Lisa decides it's worth it even if it does mean the world will end. Maybe what I want is a friend, even if that means that the world has to end. I don't know if we've all been that lonely before, but many of us have come close. You wanna ride or die? I wanna ride or die. In this case, if things don't go right, it's a ride and die. Ship then, but I 
needs explanation. You don't need to ask why. You want to ride or die. And everyone else in the ensemble seems to have figured out their own ride or die, including Lisa's brother. But you better be at dinner tonight at Mom's at 9.43. Otherwise it's just gonna be Mom and me. She's your ride. And the quarks themselves. You are my ride or die. My ride or die. When we collide. When we collide. And Carol's colleagues. You enjoy that great, great deal. I hope that curry makes you stronger. It does. Curry is my ride or die. Look, sometimes a person's ride or die isn't actually another person, and that's okay too. With some pakora and some dal and some nut on the side. I love how, by and large, the verses in this one have progressively lower emotional stakes. We go from making your first friend at the potential end of the world to familial love to anthropomorphized particles going all out in a blaze of glory to just an obsession with a really good spice. And the music stays beautiful throughout. Number 7. The people have found out the truth that Big Soap doesn't want them to know. All soap is just soap. And when the soap scientists are tasked with figuring out a way to win the people back, the people are far more interested in settling this with a dance-off. Fortunately, one of the soap scientists is Britney Spears, played by the great Kelly Marie Tran. How did it Thank feel to have you. some big snake on you? Like, were you actually not scared? Or did you just feel not scared? No, I actually know a lot about this because I am Britney Spears and not just a fan that reads a lot about Britney Spears. And she reveals the truth behind one of her most iconic live performances. I broke out in hives. I broke out in hives. Five minutes before the performance. Uh, uh, uh. And yes, this is the actual truth. These are true facts that Kelly Marie Tran just happened to know. Oops, that snake gave you hives. It gave you those hives. It gave you some hives. And yes, it turns into a parody mashup. And I love that big snake, but it must have been dirty. It was so dirty, but it made me stronger than yesterday. It's one of these delightful, let's go through all our knowledge on a specific pop culture topic songs that Off Book does so well. And it pairs particularly well with Kelly Marie Tran's joy at getting to make all these Britney references. Well, I'm not a girl, not yet a woman, so I'm still Sometimes the songs that get just a little off topic of the overall narrative are the most delightful, and sometimes they end up steering the direction of the narrative, and this is no exception. And it's followed by a similar off topic song about living near the grove, which didn't steer the direction of the story quite as much, but it's still great. This is just a really good episode. They're all really good episodes. You should all have been listening this whole time. It is Britney Bitch. It's Britney Bitch. I'm Britney Bitch. You're yeah. Britney. Number six, Nicole Parker is Claire Montgomery, and despite being a high-powered lawyer who won Dancing with the Stars, she feels down in her life ever since her ex started dating her rival. Her client, Reginald Catharsis, offers her some advice, and she starts to self-reflect. I guess I focused not on myself. Instead, I focused on every legal document. Reginald is sure to express appreciation for her misguided priorities. And that's been good for me because you're doing an excellent job on my case. But he still wants what's best for her. Because when they say not guilty, I want you to be happy too. We get a little detour for the details of the case. I can't believe Reginald Catharsis is in this courtroom. Such a famous man. Everyone knows his name. And Claire frames her problems as a math problem. Let's do what's good if for one of your you. trains leaves from Washington, D.C. at 8 and heads towards Sacramento to get there at night. And then it's just... A legitimately good Broadway song with multiple movements, especially as the train metaphor starts to hit. Sugar, 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 sugar
No shock, Nicole is both a world-class improviser and an actual on-Broadway and on-tour alphaba, so she immediately cements her place as one of Offbook's best recurring guests. Do it for you, and you, and you, and you, and a little bit of me, and you, and a little bit of you. Number 5. Paul Saborin, a.k.a. Half of Paul and Storm, a.k.a. A Quarter of Da Vinci's Notebook, guest stars in a musical about a farm family who have accumulated so many bones of people who starve to death in their corn maze and Halloween barn that they attract some vampires who want to use their facilities for a party. Will these vampires have their party of their dreams? But the three mayors of the town aren't aware of all this because they're too concerned about the run-of-the-mill Halloween spookiness. Mayors! Is it the spooky month? Is this the spooky month? Wait, what? Are we in the spooky month? I do. Right <laughs> now. In their defense, budget cuts caused October to sneak up on them. Yes, to cut the fat that we stopped buying calendars, stopped buying clocks. Oh, what do you think about that? Paul's gruff interjections really bring this one home. It's just, it's just the perfect spice on top of this. Is it the spooky month? Yeah. Is it the spooky month? I love how scared they are of innocent fake scariness when there's legitimate real scariness going on in town and they're just completely unaware. The squash had a face, a face in that place. A squash with a face, oh my dear, oh so great. Wait, hold on, that is scary news. Scarier than I can handle. Here's Zach with the layup. Was there anything else scary about the squash? And Jess with the dunk. It was lit by a candle. Is it the spooky mud? Oh, no. With all due respect to the Monster Mash and its various parodies, including the aforementioned one, this is my favorite Halloween song. It's a spooky mud. And I can't buy the creepy food. Number four. Zeke Nicholson plays a brand new mom named Clarissa who learns that motherhood has unlocked her superpowers and she needs to train with Lady Professor X at the Mom Mutant Academy in England. Can what? I ask you a question, Mr. Pilot? Absolutely. So I'm a new mom. Uh, uh, Mr. Pilot's my father. You can call me James. Okay. Mr. James Pilot. <laughs> okay, James. And while time is frozen for everyone else, she rides on the X-Jet and asks the pilot about his life. You're a man out of time. A pilot out of time. Yes. And we get a character who's not a direct analog of an X-Men character, and yet is one of my favorite characters in all of fiction. James Pilot, a baby boy born in 1892. Wow. Such a very long time ago, I bet that's confusing to you. It is. But I've been in a time loop, but I occasionally come out. But I only come out for like a day every year, so I'm still alive, no doubt. See, I would have guessed the opposite. I would have thought that continuing to live so much while time freezes around you would have made you even older. Older, but who am I to question the ways of the great Captain James Pilot? James Pilot, a pilot of time. Guest pianist Scott Simons comes in with a beautiful, mysterious build that culminates in Zach just belting his character's name in a way that's irresistible. Captain James Pilot, a pilot of time. So Clarissa tries to make sense of it using her own frame of reference. If I'm understanding your story, if I've got this clear, you're kind of like those people born on the leap year. And as if all the X-Men jokes weren't delightfully nerdy enough, Zack ties it back to Gilbert and Sullivan. It's right. a little bit similar, I'm glad that you got it at a glance. Cool. You will recognize the device from the Pirates of Penzance. My wife and I still don't know if we're going to have kids, but if we ever do, I hope she says hi to James Pilot for me. James Pilot!
number three. It's movie night for a suburban family, and there may not be many more left as Beth is off to college soon, so the parents decide to bring back a family tradition. Are you sure that you want to watch Frog Night? I mean, Frog Night's great. It's great. We both love it. But are you sure... You don't want to play the elaborate game? Oh my god, mom, dad, can we please not- Do you want to play the elaborate game? There's so many rules to the elaborate game. This is one of those comedic conceits where the more heightened and ridiculous it gets, the more real and relatable it feels. Every family has some tradition that makes no sense to an outsider, and most probably aren't this chaotic, but some sure feel like it. We put those five titles, put those five titles on the tile, and then look at them for a while. And then don't show a smile. I love Zach and Jess making up nonsensical rules, and this is one of the finest examples of that. Mix them all up, put them in the hat, put okay, the hat in the two oven. Two times for a literary reference removed. Right. I also love comedians reciting random lists of nostalgic movies. Fine and my are Sandlot, Little Giants, Rookie of the Year, The Big Green, and Steel Magnolia. It's also just a really good number for expressing characterization. Every member of the family has something they want, and they feel the rest of the family are holding them back in that one thing. Ken Burns, okay, Ken your Burns. mother is of course disqualified from the elaborate game for not picking a single film. Brett, Dana, and guest pianist Zach Marsh bring the whimsy to the music. Also, you gotta get to offbookclubhouse.com to watch the video of this episode. This song in particular is best experienced visually as Zach and Jess bring the choreo and the chaos. Such an elaborate game. Elaborate game. And after all that, we're right back where we started. But that's the risk you take with the elaborate game. Frog night. It's the frog night. But aren't you glad we played? Number two. Calvin only has two dreams, to live that Jeep lifestyle and to be an on-court ref for the NBA. Despite his dad generously giving him a Kia, he convinces his dad to cash out all the savings to get a Jeep, which he uses to speed across the country from Georgia to get to the LA Clippers ref audition, where he faces a hard truth. Well, well yeah, Jeeps are not super eco-friendly. I wish yeah. you could in like a Kia or something. Yeah, we oh, actually, really? um, yeah, you're probably a little spoiled if you have a Jeep. But yeah. um, I guess. Um, I mean, we'll see what you got. Yeah, we'll see what Wait, you got. a Kia? Spoiled? Me? You just Stop <laughs> saying single words. Yeah. Are you okay? And he has this existential crisis in the middle of the highway, and it causes a bit of chaos. Who is this? Who am I? <laughs> Did that car just drive by? And the authorities have to be brought in, and things escalate quickly. What am I doing walking down the 101? Look, frequently on the 101, walking is actually the faster option. <laughs> Was I a bad son? Please pull your car over to the side of the road. Nope. Gotta keep thinking. <laughs> Holy cow, this song is incredible. Not only are Jess's vocals and Scott's piano work absolutely gorgeous, but Jess has the impressive feat of carrying the lyrics all by herself and keeping them coherent despite what must have been incredibly distracting banter from Drew Tarver and Zach. keeps the rhymes tight and the emotions honest while accurately recapping the story so far, and it would have been a great song even without the hilarity of Drew and Zach constantly trying to stop her. Yeah, I can move that was a big so miss. Fast. Big miss. Make their guns jump. We're fired. Oh my well, god. I'm thinking about what is right, I'm moving as fast as smoke. Yeah, I'm running. Oh my god, she's as fast as smoke. Yeah, with all the chaotic moving parts, it's kind of amazing that the only slip-up made in the song is Drew and Zach forgetting Jess's character's gender. Even though those cops repeatedly refer to me as a she. It is both one of the best songs ever written and one of the funniest comedy sketches ever written, and it's completely improvised. Just bravo to all involved. 
the one oh one rent a Kia drive home and be a better son Wow that was gorgeous My number one favorite song from off book. So remember when I talked about the one year anniversary episode so effectively parodying self-congratulatory love fests? Well, the rest of the episode is not above embracing the love fest, but in the best way possible. Several characters from the first year of the podcast return, and several songs are reprised, including many of the songs you just heard me discuss on this list. James Son of Paints Mix Spectrum. Wow. Yeah, I'm walking on the one of one. Wetzel's pretzels, we're amazing. Wetzel's pretzels, we're amazing. And through delightfully absurd story convolution, it all culminates in Jess meeting Zach for the first time, beginning the podcast we all love, and one of the show's best guests, Nicole Parker, brings it all home for us. Actually, and that's how it started. <laughs> and that's how Two it began. In a room, that's how it started. That's how it started. While Healed Your Heart with the song parodied this sort of emotional self-love song, this starts out just sincerely embracing the legacy of Off Book, and it's beautiful. The events that led us to this point are so ridiculous that it's kind of hard to take this too seriously, but the song is so good that it's also kind of hard not to take it seriously. In order to make sure that the sentiment doesn't get too emotional here, Jess calls back to one of the silliest songs from the show's past. Well, that backfired because that callback just made me even more emotional. That's how it started. I'm glad that the episode called the final off book wasn't really the final off book, but if it was, what a hell of a finale this would have been. And those are my very favorite off book songs. And like I said, this was really hard to narrow down, to the point where I ended up cutting like a third of the list to keep it manageable. So you'll be able to see a discussion of some of the runners up on Patreon this coming Thursday. But in the meantime, which off book songs are your favorite? And if you haven't heard off book yet, check it out. There's 300 episodes of pure delight. So listen to as many episodes as you see fit, and then come back here and discuss your favorites in the comments. And until next time, this is Dave, signing off.